The Great Search brought to you by a different DigiKey. Thanks, DigiKey. Every single week, Lady Ada uses her powers of engineering to help you find parts that you're looking for on digikey.com. Lady Ada, what is this week's Great Search? I'm glad you asked. This one, I'm pulling it up right now. Um, so this week's Great Search, you'll never believe it. It's a part that's no longer available. Um, yeah. But I also I wanted to use this sort of as, as an excuse to look into and research some um, a class of sensors that is a near and dear to my heart, but you know, there's it's always kind of like funky um, learning about them, which is gas and volatile organic compound sensors. Um, so the board that we've been making, we can maybe go to the computer, um, is the CCS 811. This is actually one of the first, you know, low cost I squared C gas sensors available. There there are gas sensors that are analog. Um, Let's see, there's quite a few gas sensors. There's like this. This is a traditional kind of gas sensor. It's, you know, an analog output. Um, you have to turn on the heater and you have to kind of do a little bit of management and then read it. Um, what's nice is that since, you know, these, these sensors are quite good. Um, and they're, they're, that's what, this is how you measure gases. Um, depending on how the sensor is doped, um, it can measure, you know, I think carbon monoxide and alcohols and ethanes and usually they mix a whole, you know, like nit nitrogen oxides, whatever. They, they usually can sense a whole bunch of things at once, um, even analog output, and then they have to be calibrated. But for a lot of people, they just want to measure like air quality, like, you know, is, is there alcohol or gas in the area? Um, this is different than carbon dioxide sensors, which are also gas sensors, but are they usually use a different methodology. Um, we, you know, we have a couple CO2 sensors. The, the good ones that I really like are the um, SCD30 and the SCD40. The SCD30 is, you know, an amazing uh, gas sensor. It has, um, you know, an NDIR sensor tube, and it's like really well calibrated. And they're very, very good sensors, and they're true CO2 sensors. Um, most other sensors are kind of they, they guess the CO2 based on volatile organic uh, compounds. Um, so, hold on, let me go back. So usually when you do sorry, gas, um, you know, a sensor like the, um, you know, SGP30, for example, it'll say volatile organic compounds and FeCO2, effective CO2. So it's, it's kind of trying to guess, calculate the CO2 based on um, the volatile organic compounds. It, it's not true, but it does, it does a fairly good job. But you know, these are usually used, you know, air quality sensors indoor and outdoor, uh, not particulate, but for, for gases. Um, also lots of scientific uh, use cases as well. But uh, so as I mentioned, the, the CCS 811 was a classic one. Uh, one of the first ones, people rather liked it. Um, but, uh, and you know, we kind of, for now we recommend the SGP30. Uh, which is a pretty good sensor in a, as an alternative, um, it's no longer manufactured. So, you know, there is an alternative for this chip. The, uh, hold on. They recommend ah, substitutes. They recommend the ENS160, which I think is made by the same company. Um, which is also a great sensor. Um, the bad news is that uh, you're like, when am I gonna get some? And it's like, you know, like, Happy New Year 2023. Which, you know what, and I'm happy. I will, when, when that happens, I will, I will probably pick some up and we'll, we'll make a breakout for this uh, and all's good. But I wanted to find another gas sensor maybe in the meantime, uh, what, like while, while I wait for this to, to pop into stock. So uh, let's go to the gas sensor category and I'm also you know it's interesting I'm not looking for direct replacement I'm just kind of like seeing like what's what's up in this category so it's still kind of like a little vague um, I'm gonna look for active designs only because uh, that's where I'm at and you know I'm not actively looking again I have other gas sensors so I want something that's normally stocking it doesn't have to be you know in stock today um, one thing that I did notice I just sorted by you know quantity available is a uh, a bunch of CO2 sensors popped up, which is which is fine. But I actually I don't I don't want CO2 sensors. Those are again they're they're kind of different than air quality sensors. So I selected everything and then I um, I unselected carbon dioxide. That got me about 200, 200 things. Um, so a couple good things. So you know the SGP40. 
Uh, this is a sensor that I've used. Um, it's kind of the next gen of the SGP30. Uh, a good, it's a good sensor. You know, you can get um, data out of it. It does have this kind of secondary library that you need to use to actually do some some calculations. Um, that's not unusual. Uh, there's also apparently the SGP41, which I didn't know about. So I'm actually going to check this out because it's like, I, I'm assuming this is just some improved version of the SGP40. Um, there's the SCD40 CO2 sensor, which still made it through. Um, and then there's this kind of interesting, the Z mods. What's interesting is I'd heard of these, but you know, I'm kind of fascinated whenever I see something with 25,000 pieces in stock at DigiKey, because it's kind of like, oh, this must be like somewhat popular because they would not stock that many of something if it wasn't. And so I was kind of like interested in looking at this a little bit more. So we'll do that in a moment. And there's a couple in that family as well. And then um, like you see, there's the Zmod 4450, 44510, you know, A version, B version. Um, so there's a couple of these. There's the Sen 50, which uh, actually contains an SGP 41. We covered this on INPI earlier, but really it looks like the Z mods are kind of like taking over. Like there's the SGPs and there's the SCDs, but um, but these are the most interesting. So um, what's cool about these is um, they're from Wernesas, who who does make sensors and such. Let's see if we can load up the data sheet. If not, I will. Uh, I'll just go to the. Um, okay, so it's outdoor air quality sensor platform. Um, so what's interesting about this sensor is um, for interfacing, at least it's I squared C. Uh, so that's that's kind of good. I like to see that. Like I don't like it when it's like, hey, we came with some weird ass interface. Um, I squared C is pretty standard. Not worried about being able to, to communicate with it. The um, the interesting thing is it does various measurements. Looks like it measures like nitrogen dioxide, ozone, um, air quality. It's got you know it's a MOX resistant sensor like all of these are. And one of the things about MOX sensors, I will say just because you know now I've used them a couple times, is like that analog sensor I showed you earlier. There's not a lot going on with these like. They are pretty much all made the same way. There's a few patents that expired probably, and so people are making more of them. But like, the concept is the same. Like once you kind of dope it, you get this gas resistance, and you know you you have to calibrate a little bit. You have to normalize it, but you pretty much are just tracking this resistance and trying to convert that into, um, a, you know, a semi-calibrated output of what the air quality is. Um, so there's good news and bad news about that. One good news is that, you know, technically once the patents expire and people know how to make these, it's, it's not too difficult to just manufacture these um, gas sensors. The problem is, is that there is, in, in, you know, as an outsider looking in, it seems like because the, the technology is quite simple, like not simple, but it's um, you're just getting resistance value and then, you know, you, you, you track that and do with whatever you need to with it. The firmware, the stuff that actually reads that resistance and, and calculates that into something um, is usually uh, either baked into the chip, like the SGP30, or for more complicated stuff, it's kind of this external processor. And it reminds me a little bit of 9DOF sensors or 6DOF sensors where, you know, you get accelerometer and gyro data or magnetometer data, but then you have to fusion it together. And that's where intellectual property kind of comes in and becomes a firmware issue. So, you know, I looked into this and it's an interesting chip, um, but, but here's the deal. Um, you know, the data sheet is actually kind of empty. There's like really, you know, usually you open data sheets like, registers and pins and bits and all that there's there's kind of nothing here um they always have this like standard i squared c um diagram and it's like if you've if you've never heard of i squared c before like you read all about it and they always are like hey you use you there's a stop bit it's like yeah cool um but then there's nothing after that um because what you're expected to do is you down you have to submit a request to get the firmware and the firmware comes as a binary blob 
that you then link in with your um, application. So, you know, they have binaries for like the most popular platforms like, uh, you know, ARM Cortex M zeros and Espressive chips. Um, you don't get to see the code. You, you, you feed it, you know, you feed it the data and out, out pops this algorithmic thing. It also reminds me of a little bit of capacitive touch. Like microchip does the same thing with um, QTouch. Capacitive touch is just a capacitive read. There's not, there's not a lot going on. There's a couple different ways of doing the waveform, but for the most part, you're reading capacitive data and it, it floats around and then it spikes and it goes down. Um, so the intellectual property is how you filter that data and they'd want to control that. And so, uh, you know, these days when you get QTouch, it's not on the chip giving you raw data. Instead, you have to, um, I mean, you can get the raw data sometimes, but they sort of hide that. Instead, you're supposed to use this binary interface. So, you know, it's, it's interesting um, seeing how sensors have, have changed. Um, one thing I do like about Sincerian is they don't have that. Like when you, when you use their sensors, they really do pop out in I squared C, whatever data you need, it's there. It's like CO2 level, you read the register, you do a little bit of like shifting math or whatever, out pops the number. Um, with these sensors, you know, it is a little bit less expensive. You'll see it's like, you know, 350 instead of 510 or whatever. Um, but in exchange, what they do is they don't have a powerful processor on the chip. You have to use this binary blob instead. So, you know, it's, it's interesting, especially for people who are used to temperature humidity sensors that are just very simplistic in their functionality to sensors that really are mostly a front end um, to a firmware processing system. And you need, you know, I don't think that, maybe they have a library for AVR 8-bit, but, you know, they probably kind of require Cortex-M0 to do a lot of this calculation. Um, and it's, of course, under NDA. So, you know, it's interesting. I'm going to take a look at this chip, um, and, you know, maybe I can see if they've released uh, a library that I can use because it's going to be tough for me to write a library when the firmware is under NDA. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll see what's possible. So this is the, uh, the Zmod... 4510, I guess this is the new, this is the new, new way of the sensor. Um, so folks, gotta get used to it. That's a great search.